Hello and welcome back and that's right today I want to talk about a couple of flash nasses. Now I don't mean flash in the kind of <laughs> look how good I look. Ladies and gentlemen if you will look right here. I mean flash like SSDs, the growing popularity of private servers that are now moving away from let's be honest ever so slightly slower hard drives and moving towards super fast NVMe SSDs is growing in popularity all the time and I'll tell you right now two of the most desirable solutions that were revealed last year 2023 were these two and although one of them that one definitely came to the market sooner I would say right now if you are sitting on a little bit of bunts your budget the end of the year the start of your tax year I don't know and you're thinking about how to spend it on a lovely little flash solution I'm willing to bet these two have appeared on your radar. Of course they have. You came to this video, didn't you? And although there is some wildly different hardware and price points between these two devices, I'll tell you right now, these are two great examples of SSD optimized flash solutions right now in the market. And today we're going to be comparing them in price, in hardware, in port, in software, and hopefully by the end, you'll know which one best suits you, your needs, your data, and let's be honest, your buns. So let's crack on with the first reason these two devices may you know, be more selective for you. And of course, that's the price. Seriously, if what you care about is the price point and how much you're going to spend only, this video is going to be short, probably about 25 seconds long for you at home right now. And I looked at B&H, although there are loads of other retailers out there. If you look at B&H right now, these two have got a price difference of between $650 and $750, depending on the configuration you look at. Clearly, the flash store is the cheaper of the two, arriving in two configurations there, the 6-bay model um, arriving at $449 and the 12-bay model at $799. And with the TBS H574TX, can't stand that name, we're just going to call it the NASBook, uh, that arrives in an i3 and an i5 configuration of $1,199 and $1,449 for each of those tiers between them there so straight away 650 750 dollars and that doesn't include the tax the logistics your own currency where you are in the world if what you care about is the money clearly the flash store is the cheaper of the two and it's not even just because it's been in the market for some six to seven months longer than the QNAP. Hell, when this thing first launched, one of the reasons it was so, so popular, and again, only half a year old, was because it brought about the most affordable you know, fully featured flash solution for desktop in the market we'd ever seen. It was reviewed all over the place. And again, for what you are getting, a 6 or a 12 bay model, it is nearly impossible to build this system with the same hardware and still get that. So it's not even just that it's a low price point, but also it's incredible value. Now, the QNAP, on the other hand, at that price point, there is an argument that you can build similar hardware to this and get the same result. It isn't really theoretically possible once you break down into the capabilities of the ports, the connections and the software and what you can actually do with it. But on a simple baseline hardware level, it is theoretically possible to build a similar hardware equivalent to this for that price point there. But again, it's how much you can use the Thunderbolt, how much you can use the internal, the M2 NVMEs, the E1S stuff that we'll talk about later on. But ultimately, if what you care about is the price and the value for money, frankly, the flash door certainly takes the early lead. Now, storage capabilities on these two, it's going to be six of one and half a dozen of the other because both of these have approached the concept of storage in slightly different ways. And depending on what you need in your you know, overall demands are for your storage, one is going to be more popular than the other. Starting with the flash door there, it's available, as mentioned earlier on, in a 6-bay configuration and in a 12-bay configuration. It has numerous M2 NVMe 
uh, slot inside. And depending on which device you go for, the arrangement of those slots will differ ever so slightly. Each of the M2 NVMe slots inside um, support a 2280 length M2 NVMe of a Gen 3 architecture there. So that's 1000 mex uh, per slot. But it's worth highlighting that because the CPU inside the EN5105, more on that later on, has only got eight lanes to play with, technically nine, um, the result is that you've only got six bays in that six uh, slot device and 12 bays in the 12 slot, limited to Gen 3 times one speeds each. That means they've only got a thousand megs of bandwidth to play with in each slot. The 12 bay configuration requires the removal of the top layer, which has the other six bays there. Now, why is that important? That means that even though you can install inside there, fast SSDs like the WD Red SN700 this is a gen 3 SSD for NAS and you can install those inside even though this SSD promotes a speed of 3000 megs it's only going to be able to achieve bandwidth of 1000 megs in here and realistically the speed is going to reduce as well to somewhere between 8 to maybe 9950 megs for the SSDs inside there and although once you rate them together you can get higher performance numbers it still means that those 12 bays of storage have been capped in terms of their performance. And that is, when I say capped, it's been not an artificial cap. It's been necessary due to the lanes afforded to that CPU. Perhaps if they run them down via by furication down to Gen 2, perhaps they could have done more. But that still would have been a case of increasing the speed, thinning out the bandwidth. And it still would have been problematic. Now, in the case of the QNAP. Both configurations, the i3 and the i5, have only got five bays of storage. So immediately it sounds like it's at a disadvantage. However, these uh, slots here arrive as ES.1 slots. Now, what is an ES.1? Well, in brief, and sometimes I will get it wrong and call it an E1S, by the way, or an ES1. I get them mixed up all the time. So save yourself typing that in the comments, everyone. Um, these are... Just like M2 NVMEs, indeed, this system arrives with five M2 NVMe adapters that allow you to install any M2 NVMe you like. But these allow hot swapping. These allow taller drives. These allow bigger drives if you go down the right road. And ultimately, even though the adapter supports 2280 length um, uh, E1S drives, there are bigger options out there. And this system allows for those fractionally larger SSDs but also hot swapping when you need to expand the storage pool, when you need to replace a degraded uh, RAID. And thanks to QNAP's uh, QSAL anti-wear uh, leveling being built in, you can actually be selective about which drive can fail because you can select the amount of write to drives. So you've actually got an element of predictive failure, not only within QNAP's own predictive failure of storage manager, but also built into some specific SSD tools there. Additionally, again, although there's only five bays, bear in mind, these are Gen 3 times 2 uh, bandwidth afforded to them there. So 2,000 megabytes per second bandwidth afforded to them. And again, they'll only really be able to achieve between 1,500 and 1,800 megs. But still on the list, that means that individually and rated together, you're going to get higher performance there. Will you get higher performance than 12 bays? Technically, yes. Even though the 12 bay system has 12 byte drive being read and written to, you're still using an Intel Celeron architecture. More on that later on. And ultimately, that means that that versus the i3 or i5 13th generation Intel Core processor inside this means that even with all the extra drive being read and written to, you have a tremendous overhead that can't be handled by that processor in the way it can on this. Both systems support USB connected expansion devices that span multiple sizes. Arguably, there are larger expansion devices available from QNAP than there are from Asus Store and a larger range of them. But really focusing on these systems just on their own, I've got to say, again, if you're looking for higher performing storage, the QNAP is a better option. If you're looking for higher capacity storage, the Asus Store Flash Store is the better option. If you're looking for hot swapping and convenience and on the fly changing and arguably better management and handling of your storage, again, the QNAP. But if you don't think you need those enterprise level demands, certainly the Asus Store Storage Manager and the capabilities of the Flash Store do a more than you know, representative job of what you want.
Whew, boy, if you thought things were divisive when we were talking about storage and cost, strap in. Because ports and connectivity on these two are... They've gone their own way, frankly. Starting with the Asus door once again, the Flash door 6 arrives uh, with two 2.5 gig Ethernet ports on the rear. It also has two 10 gig USB ports, USB 3.2 Gen 2 on there, as well as an HDMI 2.0B connection, 4K 60 frames per second, and even an SPDIF um, output there for enhanced audio media handling as well. Now, the 12 Bay, the 12 Pro, arrives with the same USB, same visual audio out, but instead of 2 times 2.5 GBE, it arrives with a 10 gig Ethernet port there, which is lovely stuff. And again, remember, that system was $799 for a 12 bay NVMe system with 10 GBE internally. That is some great connectivity there for that price point. Again, that 10G port is going to serve as something of a bottleneck when trying to read and write from 12 M2 NVMe's at once, but also bear in mind that the rather modest hardware inside for that Intel seller on CPU means you wouldn't, you were never going to be able to really go nuts anyway, and I would question how well this system could fully saturate two 10Gs, even if it had the PCI arrangement internally in order to actually allow that. Needless to say, the port and connectivity for its price are absolutely phenomenal, but I'm not going to say they are great in the grand scheme of things. For the price point, certainly, but the lack of a failover there on the 12 uh, Pro when the other device had 2 times 2.5 GBE allowing at least a failover and the 2.5 GBE times 2 connections, although bonded together with things like port trunking, link aggregation, SMB multi-channel or load balancing in one shape or form, are all beneficial, it still means that the output and external performance does have something of a cap compared with the overall internal performance potential. Now, of course, you can use USB adapters if you choose. If you wish, you can use USB to multi-port adapters. Hell, you can go ahead and use USB to 2.5 GBE adapters if you choose to add further network connectivity to this device and add more network ports. But you can't really add another 10G port conveniently there. Now, heading over to the QNAP, Again, for that extra money, you should damn well hope there'll be better connections. And this is kind of, arguably, the entire USP of this device. Because it has 10GBE. Sure, it's got that 10GBE port. It's also got another 2.5GBE port there on the rear. So again, you've got your failover. You've got your 10 gig. You've got an additional 2.5 gig there. Additionally, not only does it support the network adapters we just mentioned, but it also supports USB to 5 gig adapters that's right you can add five gbe connections to this device via those usb ports again 10 gig usb again hdmi 4k 60 frames it's hdmi uh, 1.4 uh, which does mean 4K will be limited to 30 frames, but the 1080p will be at 60 frames. But not everyone's really using that, but it's worth highlighting. So what else has this got under its sleeve? Well, Thunderbolt. This system supports Thunderbolt 4. There are two Thunderbolt 4 ports, one there on the front, USB Type-C Thunderbolt 4, and another one on the rear. These can be utilized to directly connect a Mac or PC system to this system. Now, QNAP have reported with this device populated uh, with Samsung 980 Pros, they were able to achieve an RAID 5 environment speed of in excess of 1,600 to 1,700 sequential read and write with a single connected Thunderbolt system. When they connected two Thunderbolt systems, there was an aggregated performance of in excess of 3,000 megabytes per second via just the Thunderbolt port. And that still leaves the 10 GBE there. Now, during my own personal testing with five WDSN 700 SSDs, the numbers I hit weren't that high, but they were in excess of 12 to 1300 for one connected Windows Thunderbolt system on a four gig test file 1080p in AJA. And again, had we had another Thunderbolt connected system and indeed connected directly with the 10 GBE network or 10 GBE connected system point to point, perhaps utilizing a USB to Thunderbolt adapter like this one, it would allow you to connect a further Thunderbolt related system to this device 
via 10 GPE directly. Now, those USB Type-C ports can also be utilized for storage as well. During our original testing, rather than connecting to it via Thunderbolt, we went ahead and connected just standard USB Thunderbolt and USB 4 drives to those connections. And even though connecting via a client device over Thunderbolt to this worked in that host-client relationship, the system was still able to auto-negotiate those ports into additional storage as well, meaning those USB-C ports can be used in both directions. Ultimately, it means that in terms of ports and connectivity, as good as the flash store is in terms of the price point and what you're getting in terms of network connectivity there for the price, as a 10G NAS 799 is super cheap for a 12 bay, I've got to say, I'm still more impressed by the ports and connectivity of that QNAP. And although you're paying more, you really are getting not only better external network bandwidth connectivity, but on top of that, its ability to fully saturate those to a higher degree. We've alluded to this a bunch of times throughout the course of this video, but the internal hardware between these two, as you might expect for the price point that they both arrive with, is extraordinarily different. Although there's only six to seven months of difference in their release windows, they have gone about it a very different way, targeting different users and certainly different budgets. Now, the Asus Store Flash Door 6 and 12 arrive with the same CPU. They both arrive with the Intel Celeron M5105 processor, a quad-core CPU uh, that has has a 2.0 gigahertz uh, base level frequency that can be burst up to 2.9 when needed. It also arrives with 4 gig of DDR4 memory that can be upgraded to 16 gig via an internal memory sodium slot. Now that's non-ECC memory, neither of these are ECC memory. Um, I will say, I don't quite like, and I said this in my earlier reviews, I think it's weird that the standard 6 bay and the 12 bay Pro with a 10G port have both got the same CPU and both got 4 gig of memory. I like that it can be upgraded to 16 gig, but I don't know why they di differentiate the CPUs just a little bit there, because it kind of makes you wonder what you're spending the other $350 on other than 10 GBE and the extra six bays on there. Maybe that's enough for some users, but I'm surprised they didn't scale up that CPU, perhaps at the time of launch, to something like the N6005. But again, deadlines, how long this is in the development, we simply don't know. Now, that internal hardware, comparatively is modest but for the price point and what you're getting it's pretty darn good i will also highlight that hardware although it can't really make the most of 12 bays of ssd storage and again we've talked about the lanes being afforded to those individual bays it still does a very good job of running the um, adm software that we'll talk about in a bit and on top of that you you know given those are limited to gen 3 times 1 because of those lanes your expectations need to be a little lower anyway. This just allows users a true entry-level product into the world of NVMe Flash. That is what it's designed to be. Now, this is not designed to be that. And therefore, unfortunately, although we're comparing them, we still need to recalibrate ourselves a little bit. Now, this arrives with, an, as mentioned, an Intel 13th generation i3 or i5 processor there so there's a slight difference in the number of cores and threads and overall frequency but in the grand scheme of things and i'm sure it's been on screen the result is this system has a much more powerful cpu it has a much more um uh feature rich cpu it has more lanes technically to play with very technically depending on how you break them down very technically indeed but ultimately it means this cpu is what allows the uh, Thunderbolt connectivity on this is what allows those PCIs to have a greater depth of bandwidth afforded to them. It's actually technically a Gen 4 CPU there, but they had to re um, recalibrate or at least revisit how those lanes were going to be utilized in this system. Ultimately, it means that this system here, that CPU inside, it's not just about raw power and lanes, but it's the fact that it can sustain and handle that uh, performance. When you've got NVMEs firing all that performance through all of that data going via the available bandwidth channels, you need to have a CPU that can take that rope and run with it. And notwithstanding the fact that we did uh, Plex Media server testing on this box, this could run multiple 8K files in Plex Media server without breaking a sweat. This system here could run 
the dentist file that I had on Plex Media Server, a 400 megabit HEVC 4K file, and it could play six of those files at once, and the CPU went to just 8% utilization. And that was with hardware transcoding enabled as well. Ultimately, that CPU is incredible for what you're trying to do. However, I will say the way they have approached memory on this system hacks me off. Arriving with either 12 gig or 16 gig of memory, non-ECC memory. This is soldered to the board. So I'm already cheesed off for two reasons. Number one, what is 12 gig? What an odd number for the i3 model. Two, the 16 gig being soldered means that I can't achieve the 64 gig that this CPU can achieve because the memory is soldered. It's not sodium, it's not dim. I can't remove it, can't replace it, can't upgrade it. Now, in itself, that's plenty of memory. You know, it's four times what's inside this by default. And, you know, I'm paying extra, it bloody should be. But if you use the default settings on this box and you set it up by default, you're given a choice normally for QUTS, the ZFS file platform, or QTS, and by the way, using ZFS, harking back to the storage stuff there, infinitely better, inline compaction, inline deduplication, inline compression, uh, benefits of triple parity rate, benefits of improved um, caching there, the removal of the volume layer, incredible stuff, uh, absolutely beautiful. But, if you pick the ZFS to QUTF option, the QUTS option, that is a much more memory hungry file system. The ZFS file system will eat up the memory. When you are creating shared folders, when you are creating uh, your new storage areas, by default, a lot of them will have inline compression or inline compaction or inline to duplication enabled by default, or you might use them by default. And when ZFS gets hungry, the memory consumption grows exponentially. We noticed it during our Plex testing that although the system had 16 gig, because we'd run some applications because we were you know utilizing some of the elements of zfs the amount of memory afforded to us it, zfs just consumed it all up and 16 gig by default is just not a lot now maybe it's a channel limitation maybe the reason they went for soldered memory not only to maintain the heat dissipation and the cooling factor of this rather compact chassis um they went for that to you know people can't upgrade it and maybe for cost efficiency but also they may have done it due to the number of channels afforded to the cpu and trying to be very tactical with the hardware architecture ultimately this all adds up to the fact that for all of my love of the cpu inside this system i am not in love with the way they've approached memory on this and again 12 gig of memory who does that um ultimately I still believe in terms of internal hardware, the QNAP wins. The NASBook there just gives more and can maintain that performance considerably more and the rest of the system benefits considerably more by that hardware. But there's no avoiding that the uh, Intel architecture and the upgradable memory of the flash drive at that price point is still something to behold. <laughs>「talking about the capabilities of ADM and QTS slash QUTS and again I've done full feature videos on both of these platforms both within their respective reviews and as dedicated reviews for the operating systems however we have to boil it down for this video and I can tell you what they both do they both do on-site synchronization localized backups remote backups cloud synchronization and cloud backups they've both got managed backup tools for that they both arrive with the ability to do snapshots they both arrive with the ability to run virtual machines they both arrive with surveillance tools they both arrive with multimedia tools they both arrive with container management tools they both arrive with all of those dlna multimedia home backup file management tools that you need alongside a parallel hdmi interface Asus Door Portal, HD Station, that allows you to create a local access point to the NAS, not mirroring that of the remote access, but a completely independent GUI that can be controlled with the remote, controlled with a KVN, lots of stuff there. However, there's simply no avoiding that the software is more evolved on the QNAP platform. On the QNAP platform, they've got a lot more AI integration. They have got integration of their own first-party VM tool, and that's kind of the way things move forward they've got their own hybrid mount application they've got their own box safe application to synchronize on that first party tool with google workspace office 365 and i could the list could just go on and on for the range of first party applications that qnap provide they both arrive a bunch of mobile applications and desktop applications but asus store 
tends to have first party apps for the, and I hate to say it, more rudimentary tools at the time of recording than any of the AAA tools. And when there is an AA or AAA tool required, such as virtualization, they use a third party tool like VirtualBox. Or when they do have first party AA or AAA tools, because they're a smaller organization than QNAP and they've got less units in the field and therefore less funding as an organization, the apps themselves don't get the same fully featured app upgrade treatment. One of the best examples is Surveillance Center. Surveillance Center, their own surveillance tool, in of itself is a very good tool. It's got the live feed, and again, you can see my full video showing the mobile app, the desktop application, and using the HDMI input is very good. But it does feel dated. It doesn't have the AI feature-rich experience. It doesn't have a lot of the add-ons. It doesn't have, it doesn't feel very modern. It doesn't feel as responsive as QVR Pro does on the QNAP, and the QNAP and QVR Pro are run with eight camera licenses as well. It's just another example of how the software between these two, what you have is a baseline very good experience with the Acer Store, but doesn't feel as evolved, doesn't feel as current. It's still good, it's still stable, it does what it says it will do. But on the QNAP, it's a more feature rich, more modern experience as well. Although I will argue it is also occasionally a very inconsistent experience from one app to the other in terms of design and responsiveness. But nonetheless, it's still a more feature rich experience overall. The conclusion. Right now, if you haven't already worked it out for yourself based at this point in the video, let me hold your hand a bit further. If you're looking at budget, if you're trying to save a bit of bunt, and if you're looking for value for money, the Asus Door Flash Door 6 and Pro, uh, 12 Pro is a phenomenally good choice. You have to lower your expectations and understand that with that 499, 799 price tag, you are obviously having to make compromises in the abilities and the scope of its capabilities, but for what you are getting, it is unbeatable. And as I mentioned earlier on, you could not build this for less than they are charging and they are providing a turnkey now solution there is a reason it is a damn popular device the QNAP on the other hand is a pro Shuma item it is targeting photo video editors it is targeting power users in a way that this can't and it, its price tag relative to what it is and relative to other Thunderbolt equipped NAS devices is still good value for money in its own Bubble. It is a genuinely unique device, and I would argue, much like the Flash Store there from Ata Store, you would struggle to build this for the same amount of money. Remember, 10GBE, Thunderbolt 4, E1S drives there inside the whole system as a whole, and that 13th Gen i5 in a mobile sock build. You'd be hard pushed to get that, and remember, this is also a turnkey now. But just bear in mind, this is a prosumer device. And if you were looking at a prosumer solution for your business, maybe your Soho, maybe you want to run it as Plex Media Server and more, then good for you. But if you don't think you're going to do those things, this side of the table has a lot to offer. And again, it's a more streamlined, it's a much smaller experience, but it is still feature packed in its own way. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. There are links to both the written and video reviews for both of these in the description below. There's also links to buy these uh, products from Amazon, B&H, and a bunch of other retailers. And if you were going to go to those shops anyway, that's very important. If you're going to go to them, use those links anyway. It will result in a kickback here to me and Eddie. A little fee doesn't cost you any extra. The brands just pay us a bit of money back, and it allows us to keep doing what we do. If you need further help, use the free advice section on the right-hand side of every page at NAS Compares. Contact us via our Discord or ask.nas compares the forum and the community there. Alternatively, go to Ko-Fi or Coffee or our Patreon to not only get access to these videos early, but also join our membership tiers where you can get exclusive content on mon our monthly Zooms or use the Zoom consultation uh, option there to have a Zoom consultation with me or Eddie to help you get the right setup for your needs. But apart from that, have yourselves a fantastic week.